Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to today's first Mares TA webinar. It is my great pleasure to introduce Rear Admiral Nick Lambert. Nick had an illustrious career in Her Majesty's Royal Navy for over 36 years and 50 days. And uh, he finished his career as the UK National Hydrographer. Uh, Nick is a, an absolute expert in things maritime. And today he will be talking about uh, what we need to do to capture the, the, the essence of the energy of the sea. Um, and the title of his talk is really focused on how do we overcome sea blindness? So on that note, I would very much like to hand over to Nick. And Nick, could you start your presentation, please? Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed for the kind introduction, Steve. And I'm really privileged to be here uh, talking to you all today and, uh, and particularly to be working with ADB. What, what a wonderful opportunity. Steve, can you hear me and can you see my title slide? Yes, we can, Nick. Thank you. Brilliant. And it's also my opportunity to introduce my uh, fellow uh, co-founding director of NLA International, Andy Hamflet. Um, he's an absolute wizard in research and uh, knows a huge amount about the blue economy. He's actually based in Malaysia and he's here on screen. He'll, he'll help in the Q&A session. And if you have questions that you wish to answer during my, my presentation, please do put them into the chat or the Q&A and Andy will do his best to answer them. We will also wrap up all the questions that are asked in Q&A at the end uh, so that we can summarize them, uh, summarize the answers along with providing the presentations. There are a lot of links in the presentation which you, uh, you will not see or you'll only see fleetingly. So we'll make sure that those are provided to you as well for further research. So um, as Steve says, I'm here to, think, uh, to tell you about an alternative way of thinking about our seas and oceans uh, and how can we bring them into the mainstream of our socioeconomic activity and how can we uh, do something about properly understanding them as a marine environment and all the resource they bring for us and how do we uh, extract socioeconomic benefit from them uh, in, in order to uh, support the world's population but to do so in a sustainable way. There's been a lot in the media recently. Uh, everybody's now aware of Evergreen and the Suez Canal and global logistics. And the Seaspiracy uh, documentary has generated a lot of heat, uh, not quite so much light. Um, we could see these as disaster stories. Um, and I suppose these little cameos, they, they are a mixtures of, 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 um, of problems, but actually they also demonstrate the importance of our seas and oceans they demonstrate that we can do something about uh, improving our understanding and the way we operate in our seas and oceans. And of course, the beauty of modern media means that we are getting the man and the lady in the street to see uh, what is going on at sea. And this is the sea vision point that I'll pick up uh, on a bit later on. So actually our oceans are not uh, just a focal point for uh, environmental threats and disasters. They are actually untapped potential. And that's the way we will uh, sustain ourselves in the future. And we must bring into play the sort of ingenuity, and I'm, that's a play on words deliberately, that is being demonstrated on Mars as we're flying uh, a small helicopter up there for the first time. We need that sort of ingenuity to come to our seas and oceans and that sort of massive investment in effort uh, to come to our seas and oceans. Uh, I was very lucky that President Biden uh, announced the decisive decade yesterday and some enormous steps uh, towards reducing emissions uh, on the part of the US government. And of course, that ties in beautifully with what uh, I'm gonna talk about today. And I'm just gonna re-emphasize decisive decade, 10 years. We need to start this now. Uh, we've done a lot of talking about it for many years, but we really need to start it now. So these are the things I'm going to talk about. A rhetorical question, oceans in crisis. I'm going to talk about the capital that we have in our seas and oceans and the advantages that they offer us. I'm going to talk about how we bring in sustainable finance. And particularly, I'm going to talk about how we need to make whatever we do at sea make money. 
and then I will draw some thoughts together around the shift that I've seen from sea blindness uh, to sea vision. Okay, um, Steve said I spent a long time in the Navy. I managed to find a little photograph of me taken by my mum, first time she'd seen me in, in 18 weeks in 1977. Uh, I left the Navy uh, nearly 10 years ago. Uh, and during that time, I spent the bulk of my time at sea on, on operations of one form or another. I've seen what we've done to our seas and oceans. I used to throw gash over the side of the ship because that's what we did back in 1977. We don't anymore. And I've seen Pepsi Cola bottles right out in the deepest reaches of the Southern Oceans. And I've seen plastics in Antarctica and all the rest of it. So I have got this passion now for doing about something about our seas and oceans. NLA International is deliberately a blue economy solutions company. There's about 40 or 45 associates all working together. I introduced Andy earlier on a range of different projects uh, that are bring together modern technologies such as satellite uh, systems, uh, which we can use to provide sea vision to counter illegal fishing. We're thinking about smart connected fish farms. Uh, we're very involved in quantum technologies because we need resilient position, navigation and time. And I love the, uh, the bottom right hand slide here, which is a quantum technology clock held together by plastic tie wraps. Uh, so we're very much involved in some research and development and low TRL technologies, looking for opportunities to bring these technologies to our seas and oceans and to our blue economy. You can see from the spectrum of activity on this slide uh, that we're thinking very, very broadly. Uh, we do so deliberately because we look for, deliberately look for opportunities between blue economy sectors. Can we combine renewable energy uh, with uh, aquaculture, with um, positive control of shipping, with um, uh, restoration of fish stocks or the seabed? How do we think uh, in a more coherent way across all of these different blue economy subsectors? and draw together the opportunities that they can gain from sharing information and activity. And that's why the Mares program uh, is in my opinion, so well funded, founded in terms of concept and potential. Oceans in crisis, the rhetorical question. We tend to talk about everything, about the seas and oceans as being a crisis um, everything is looming, the numbers are huge and frightening. And it's absolutely true that we use our oceans for take, make and dispose activities. Fishing is a primal extractive activity. Um, it, is, it is, we haven't really, even though we've done well, we haven't really got into the business of really maintaining sustainable fish stocks or fish populations. Um, and we are fishing. Uh, in at unsustainable levels at the moment. Um, I'm particularly taken by sea level rise and ocean acidification. Um, sea level rise, if you haven't had a chance to look at John Englander's book, do have a look at it. It's a stunning read. It's almost like a novel. Um, and it really does bring home the problem we've got. We have passed the tipping point of rising sea levels. We have got ocean acidification as a major problem. But I believe that it is this rising sea levels issue which is going to help us drive an understanding of what's going on in our seas and oceans. It is rising sea level, which is a global issue. It's happening now. That's why we have bigger storms, more uh, unpleasant or, or different weather conditions. Um, but it, so it's a global issue but it's gonna have a local impact because 600 million people are being affected by it now and will be in the next decade or two. So we've really got to think about how we break out of the silos that we're currently in and how are we going to address problems of sea level rise. We could see it as simply a disaster and we could all simply move to higher ground. But actually, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to bring the blue economy into the mainstream and to bring 
very, very innovative technologies into play. It's an opportunity to have floating offshore harbors, combining those with renewable energy platforms. It's an opportunity to bring in architects, infrastructure engineers, planners, lawyers, financial leaders, policymakers, politicians, the military. This has got to become mainstream. Um, we will either make it happen, we will either seize those opportunities, or we'll have to start abandoning some significant chunks of, uh, of coastal areas. Uh, and there's going to be a balance between the two. Personally, I'm very excited about it. I've been talking blue economy now for about 10 to 15 years. Uh, 10 to 15 years ago, people patted me on the head and said, don't worry, Nick, you'll get over it. Now we're seeing mainstream politicians talking about it. And I'll come on to that in a second. So it's a capital opportunity. The ocean is hugely valuable to us in everything from carbon sequestration and, uh, and being the sort of heart of our, uh, of our global climate, all the way through to the resources that reside on the seabed, in the water column and in the coastal zones. And there is an increasing effort to understand the true value of these seas and oceans. And I'm just going to diverge for a second or two just to talk about this. In my head, there's two types of blue economy. There's the national blue economies that we as, uh, as coastal states enjoy with uh, exclusive economic zones that go out to 200 or 300 miles. And we have various levels of, of control over those sea spaces. There are complex sea basins, regions like uh, Asia, where their sea space is surrounded by coastal um, nations, all with an interest in a particular sea space, and therefore they could combine effort to manage that sea space. And then beyond that, you've got the high seas, which is largely unregulated, or how shall I describe, loosely governed, shall we say. Um, and uh, if we are going to manage the effects of climate change, if we're going to uh, be in control of how the capital in those uh, high seas blue economies are controlled, then we've got to coordinate that. We've got to bring more regulation to it. We've got to govern it better. And the answer to that is um, sea vision. You can see that we'll, we'll provide the links to these various uh, documents here. Um, but the point is that people are now starting to value and there is actually, it says here, one of them, a race to put a price on the world's oceans. Once you value, if you can see what's going on up there, you can value what is out there. And then you can see, well, actually, that has got huge value. I really do need to govern it better. I really do need to uh, get the socioeconomic benefit from it in a more sophisticated way. Blue economy, um, as a term, I mentioned I used to be patted on the head. Actually, this has really moved on in the last 10 years or so. We're starting to see some uh, really um, well thought through definitions of the blue economy and its subsectors. I love this particular uh, document on the left here, which says uh, blue economy is more than resources. We have to focus on social equity and governance. We really must bring that. We manage our terrestrial environment properly. We have national parks. We look after um, our terrestrial spaces. We're not doing that properly at sea, although there are some very good initiatives in there. It's fantastic to see other sectors aligning with the blue economy um, and people starting to talk blue economy. And there's some great work being done in Canada. Canada has a particularly sophisticated blue economy strategy, as does my personal favourite, which is the Irish harnessing our ocean wealth strategy. And here we are with Bangladesh, now uh, have been running a blue economy cell in their government for the last five or six years, and they are using uh, blue economy definitions and terminologies to develop their national economy. And of course, uh, Bangladesh is also going to be, uh, is already being seriously affected by uh, sea level rise. And the bilateral approach is starting to come in. I mentioned complex sea basins, and it was great to see uh, Pakistan talking about cooperating uh, with friendly nations um, in their sea space and working regionally. And I think we're beginning to see that. Or say we see many aspects of that in the uh, Asia region, Asia Pacific region. Although, of course, uh, an undercurrent to all of this 
is the contest uh, or the, uh, the, the discussion that takes place across boundaries, national boundaries and so on. But again, as we begin to realize that we need to do something about the blue economy, so we will negotiate boundaries more effectively. Uh, Canada and USA sorted out their boundaries a couple of years ago, as did Bangladesh and, uh, and India. So these discussions do take place, they do work, and we do get uh, a settlement. Regenerative finance. I, I, I love this regenerative uh, phrase, which I, I uh, unapologetically plagiarized from ADB. And I think this idea of of moving away from take, make and dispose towards regenerative is absolutely spot on and is exactly what we should be doing. We're starting to see blue carbon credits. We're starting to see blue bonds. We're Canadian blue economy, uh, global blue ocean fund is really exciting. The Seychelles have got a blue bond uh, approach. Not much money in it, about $50 million, um, but what a cracking start. Um, we need more of this. Uh, because if we're going to achieve what I see as um, or my ambition for it in my lifetime, this is going to need shed loads of investment. And so some of these uh, um, uh, indicators that we're moving to blue bond government investments and particularly the development banks getting involved. And I will highlight uh, Ingrid Van Vezen's uh, recent article in the China Daily, uh, which really brings this out very clearly. Uh, we've got to make the business models work. We've got to bring money in. We've got to make people realize uh, that the markets can benefit from this blue economy where the margins are much greater, the profit margins are much greater and the opportunities are greater than, uh, than many of what, what she referred to as, as the red, uh, red economies where the, uh, the, the traditional sectors are already very well established and margins are very, very tight. The other indicator we're seeing is the growth in tech accelerators. Very exciting, um, huge steps up. This is, this is actually tech accelerators in the US uh, over the last few years. And you can see uh, marine tech innovation hubs growing there exponentially. And as I said, we'll provide these slides. So from regenerative finance to regenerative business models, I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes on this one. Um, People do things at sea because they can make money. We, we talk all the time about illegal behavior. And we talk about illegal fishing vessels. Fishing vessels don't fish illegally. People fish illegally. Company fish illegally. The banks that provide loans for fishing vessels, the insurance companies that insure them, the accountants that go through those company books every year. They're all people. And they are all involved in an unsustainable criminal activity or a marginal activity. And they do it because they make money. They don't do it because they like enslaving people and treating people badly. They do it because the regulations are not there to ensure the standards of, of the workplace that one would require terrestrially. Um, so the, we, need to, we need to shift away from this focus on illegal behavior. I'm not saying we shouldn't do something about it, but we need to move towards legal behavior. The opposite to illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing is legal, regulated, and reported fishing. It is, um, it is an environment where fisher people are able to make a good living from sustainable fish stocks in a legal, sustainable way. It is something where we need to think about how we make their business models work. The reason why so, so many people fish illegally at the moment is because they can make money. It's because the regulations, the boring things that we need to enforce, that we need to bring into place, we need to manage properly because the regulations are slack enough to allow them to make a profit. More legal behaviors such as shipping. Um, we've been doing that for donkey's years. We've been moving things around by sea, but suddenly we're now all aware of the emissions that come from it. So although shipping is legal, although it's legal to use heavy fuel oil, it is environmentally unsustainable. So we have a business model which is legal, people are making money from it, but it's not sustainable. So this is why I think that the Mara's uh, regenerative multifunction approach is exactly the way should we, be go we should be going. Let's get rid of end take, 
uh, uh, sorry, let's end, take, make and discard. Let's put back in more than we take out from our seas and oceans. Let's bring them into mainstream activity. Let's link them firmly and make them part of our, our uh, complex sea basins, of our, of our, sea, of our um, coastal zones, of our coastal communities, bearing in mind that the bulk of the world's population lives on the coastline. Um, it's happening here in, in, the, in Northwest Europe. We're seeing, uh, we'll be, soon you'll be able to walk across the North Sea, hop in from wind farm to wind farm. The sea space is becoming more and more complex. The infrastructure is becoming more complex. It's a very, very exciting time. If you're a boring mariner, you'll probably moan about all these things being the way of shipping. Um, I, I'd rather see it the other way around. I think this is a very exciting time to bring renewable energy together with so many other subsectors of the blue economy. I just, I, I, I would, you'd be fantastic to see a floating offshore harbour somewhere in the English Channel with renewable energy systems all around it, uh, with aquaculture combined with it, and flying um, in some sort of sustainable airship um, uh, um, goods from that uh, from that floating port straight into Birmingham and putting it into the hub of the glo UK's global logistics network. Okay, I've gone off on one, but that's the sort of thing that we can do, but we're gonna need to bring in a lot of clever people uh, from the wider uh, population to make that happen. So, um, calming down a bit, uh, moving uh, towards uh, C, uh, vision and emerging innovation. The reason I mentioned sea vision is because for most of that naval career that, that Steve Peters kindly mentioned, um, I listened to crusty old admirals wringing their hands and bemoaning the fact that nobody understood what goes on at sea and our navy's getting too small and they don't know that 90% of everything goes by sea and uh, the clothes that the man on the M25 is wearing came by sea. Um, we suffer from sea blindness. That is no longer the case. Humanity can see what's going on at sea. Uh, the technologies that we've got out there, space-based technologies, AI and ML, the ability to crunch huge amounts of data, uh, gives us the ability to manage our national and our regional sea spaces, those complex sea bases I talked about. The, the Southeast Asia region is is a particularly important one, a particularly complex one, but it also gives us the ability to manage our high seas. We can, if we throw enough beans at this, we can see everything that we want to see. Um, pretty much, I, if, if you, if you uh, gave me the resources, I could show you everything that's going on in, in the China Sea, the China Seas um, from tomorrow, over the course of two or three years, I can have as near 100% perfect picture as would be possible, and it would all be from commercially available data sources. Um, so I'm going to just give you an example of Sea Vision and how it's enabled by uh, by technologies um, from space and and uh, um, more uh, closer to in the air and the sea surface and underwater. Just the little videos. There's no audio on, on them. There's one with captions and I'll talk over the first three. Andy, am I still coming through loud and clear? Yeah, we got you, Nick. Cool. Um, so, so here is a, um, a CubeSats being spat out of the International Space Station. Um, last, in 2017, India hit the record for uh, more than 100 CubeSats put into space in one launch. And, uh, and this was smashed uh, this year by SpaceX in January who launched 143 small sats in a one-up. Um, they go into low Earth orbit. They take a range of different sensors. It's very exciting. The data sets will be enormously beneficial. There's a whole saga about space debris, uh, but it, there's a thing to learn there. The space sector is now realizing they need to clean up their act exactly the same way as we need to do at sea. But these little CubeSats uh, are going to be are already game-changing bits of kit, uh, and the data they provide is awesome. And it's all about the data, stupid. It's not about the exciting, uh, sexy things that, um, that we put into space. It's all about the, uh, the data that comes from them, and I'll touch on that in a moment. 
drones. Everybody talks about drones in a sort of threatening way, but actually they're very exciting. Uh, this is a small drone. There are very big drones. I think we could do a lot with very big drones. This is one from an Israeli company called App and Space, and it's particularly designed for inshore fishing operations uh, to be to being used to counter illegal fishing. There's that illegal word again. Uh, we're involved in the moment in a, in a fishing prosecution, providing expert witness for a fishing prosecution case. Um, this could be used legally. Wouldn't it be wonderful if a fisherman could say, um, I'm out here fishing, I've got my nets in the water, I'm fishing legally, and um, yep, sure enough, that's corroborated by an overflight, by a small drone to say, yep, he was fishing in the right place, and look, here's his nets, it's the right kind, he was doing the right thing. So we're starting to see this convergence of um, autonomous systems of different kinds, advanced um, uh, miniaturized sensors, and machine learning uh, systems, data sets, and uh, means of analyzing those data sets being brought to all parts of the open, of the ocean environment. Uh, COVID, COVID's been interesting because COVID has driven lots of new ways of thinking um, in, uh, in our society as a whole. We're all now working remotely. And um, this, I like this particular example. This is the USA's uh, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration organization. Uh, their fisheries section uh, realized that they were going to have a real problem carrying out their standard uh, fisheries survey schedules in the Barents Sea. So they obtained uh, three sail drones. Uh, these you can see top right here. It's <laughs> very clever. I mean, you in my early days, I thought these things would never survive a storm. Well, here it is in a in a fairly benign day and sunny day in the in the Barents Sea. Uh, they sailed them autonomously from California. Um, <coughs> it took them six weeks to get to the Eastern Bering Sea, and they then did the 60-day uh, fisheries survey. They were effectively an emergency COVID measure. Uh, they were fitted with um, uh, fish-finding sonars, um, but despite the fact that they were an emergency uh, technology, suddenly they were bringing back data sets that were pretty much as good as those that would have been provided by a manned survey vessel. Not quite good at, um, quite so good at uh, differentiating between the species of fish, but nonetheless enough data to keep them going. Uh, they also gathered all sorts of um, ephemeral data about the environment, wind, salinity data, and so on. And these uh, snapshots, compressed snapshots of the data are fired back uh, via satellite four times an hour. So what a what an innovative pivot, what an innovative thinking on part of a government agency to maintain a particularly important fisheries survey uh, using modern technology. And um, it's normally about, at this point, everybody gets very excited about the sail drone. Don't forget, it's about the sensors. It's about the data that's coming in. What can we do? I, I frankly, whilst excited by things like sail drone, I'm not interested in the platform that gathers the data, really. What I want is the data. And what excites me is the, um, the analyst, the human analyst, analyst we can bring to that data and the information we can extract from it, which will allow decision making. Um, I'm not gonna stop talking for a couple of seconds, have a quick swig of water while Aquabyte's um, technology for counting sea lice is shown to you. And you'll see the captions coming up as as the video runs. So here we go.
Now, I, I think this sort of technology is hugely important. We need to move to a second generation of, um, of aquaculture. Um, I don't subscribe to the, the alarmist view that came across in Seaspiracy, although I quite understand why the editor reflected on aquaculture in the way that he did. Um, it, it, aquaculture is, is again becoming mainstream, but it's got to get more mainstream. It's got to go into a second generation cleaner, uh, cleaner uh, technologies. We've got to bring more money into it, better technology into it. And here's an example of what can be done to address some of these issues. It is a fact of life that we have to feed a growing world population. We need protein from the sea. Fish are in a, um, an environment, uh, a zero gravity environment, effectively. Um, the gravity environment shoreside is different. So the, the difference between farming cattle and farming fish um, has huge implications for the amount of feed required for fish. Um, it's far less, it's far more efficient. So we've really got to address this. And these are the sorts of technologies that can do it. But just one or two cameras and some software like this ain't going to crack it. We need to bring in big corporates, big organizations, big industry have got to get involved in this. And then we've got to manage it properly and make it sustainable. It's all very easy for me to wave my arms around and say that, uh, but that's what we've got to do. And we need to start doing it now. Uh, I love this one. This is William Gibson. This says December the 4th, 2003. I think he said it actually a bit earlier than that in the 1990s. I found all sorts of different times when he said it. Um, he said the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And various uh, writers since have adapted that to the technology is already here. It's just not e evenly distributed. And, um, and I, you, you can play games with this. But the point is, we can do it now. We know we've got a problem. Let's crack on and do something about it, as opposed to keep researching it and keep discussing it. Let's do something about it. And the emerging offshore potential of wind and sea and tide as a, a wave and tidal energy is absolutely enormous. I won't go all round round all of these examples. They're pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the world's first um, offshore floating wind, high wind, Scotland top right there. Um, and then um, bottom right, ocean energy thermal converters, bottom left, harnessing um, renewable sources all at the same time, uh, different types, waves, wind and solar, all can be done. Looks a bit Heath Robinson, but it can work. But again, it's my point about proper, significant offshore infrastructure. The future's here. We can do it. Um, the biggest winners are going to be those large ocean states, what we in the West have rudely referred to as small island developing states for so many years. Actually, large ocean states with huge EEZs, masses of resources, vast potential with a risk of sea level rise, of course. Uh, but they are the ones who could uh, really benefit from these sorts of potentials. There is a problem, of course. Um, they don't have the populations to... Uh, to use all that renewable energy. So they need, need to have other economic activities to take the benefit of the, uh, the renewable energy, or they have to be able to export it. And what better way of doing that than in, say, exporting, converting it to hydrogen export. But the countries, uh, the regions, and the industry partners that are brought in to, you, to develop these technologies, to work together, to cooperate operate across those borders, as was said uh, uh, in Bangladesh just recently, uh, sorry, Pakistan just recently. Um, these are the nations that are gonna see the benefit from, uh, from them. Very often, it is a case if you have to demonstrate that this works. And that's why I uh, keep banging on about Maris, because Maris has the opportunity to demonstrate that combining these sorts of technologies across the subsectors of the blue economy, um, uh, Mares can show that that will work. And once we start showing that it will work, then we'll start to get traction. Um, on the other hand, um, sustainable uh, electricity generation from these uh, technologies has only increased uh, an estimated 13% 
um, in 2019. And this is, although this is significantly above the level, I'm just going to my notes now, although this is significantly above the levels of the previous three years, it's still far below the annual growth of 23% required to meet the International Energy Agency's sustainable development target by 2030. So if the opportunity is so clear, as I was, uh, as I was showing in my previous uh, slide, the technology is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Um, why are we still seeing graphs like that? And I think a lot of it is cultural. We've just got to break out of our silos. There's so many human um, behavioral is issues that we've got to, got to get into here. There's an apocryphal tale in the UK, and there may be some truth in it, that we put wind um, uh, turbine towers into the North Sea. We didn't know about the damn sea scouring that would affect from tidal effect, would result from tidal effect. And we hadn't bothered to talk to the oil and gas industry, it spent the previous 50 years learning that lesson. Um, secondly, um, the, the, is the, the barrier to investment is this issue of having renewable energy near to the generation site. So there's no compelling commercial driver for investment. So that brings me back to the point of you've got to make business models work. So it's all very well demonstrating that something works. Not only do you demonstrate it, you must show that there's a business model that works. Right back to my point earlier on, people need to make money to make the economy work. So uh, just to recap, this slide should build for me. We need to move from take, make and dispose mindsets to regenerative blue economies. And the blue economy is absolutely and utterly integrated with a sustainable marine environment. It goes without saying. Sea vision, once you can see what's going on somewhere, once you can map it, only 20% of our seas and oceans have been mapped to modern standards. Once you can map it, once you can see what's going on, you can govern it, you can regulate it, you can monitor it, you can build an economy from it. Let's not stop, let's stop talking about the technologies, let's grab hold of them and start using them. But don't forget that we must have business models that people will use. So don't just talk about the technologies. Don't just get excited about the wiggly amps that come from renewable energy. Talk about the business models. Show people how capital can flow. Explain why they can invest in these uh, opportunities with confidence and show how they will sustain the environment. And I think you'll be pleased to hear that's it. Thank you very much, Nick. That was a very full presentation. Um, I've just opened the floor for questions. Um, I notice everyone's being very polite and is listening. And uh, I suppose um, if there's anything, Andy, do you want to add anything that you wanted to just put some additional colour on it? Um, I think Nick's done it ably well. Um, I'd just say it, we're really excited about all this and it's we're also trying to track how individual nations are trying to throw their arms around these opportunities themselves. There's a lot of work here to, to as Nick say, break out of the silos uh, and bring people together, but uh, we're, we're quite encouraged by where it's happening and how people are coming at it at pace. So I suppose the next thing is to open the floor up for questions. Uh, uh, sure. So David Elzinger was asking um, uh, about the TRL levels of technology. I know we've had some previous speakers talk about it, but Nick and Andy, what do you think of the two most, the, the, the promising ones with their TRL status, like six or seven ready to go or eight ready, which is fully organised? They are, in, well, um, people are sceptical about it. It says, I think um, Steve, uh, Dave Elzinger says, I remain sceptical of only, uh, ocean energy. Um, I, I, I'm, I was with you, David, about um, probably about five, six years ago. Um, I was pretty sceptical. But um, we're now powering the UK for days at a time using offshore wind. 
the TRL's nine there. The stuff is the wiggly amps are pumping ashore. Um, and I think we're going we're going to see that some of the ones I showed you look very Heath Robinson, I agree. Um, but the technology is improving all the time. Um, Simply Blue Energy in Ireland signed a big deal with Shell uh, just a few weeks ago for floating wind to the south of Cork. Um, the US is investing massively and Biden will achieve his objectives by renewable energy. So renewable energy is, is um, increasingly compelling in my opinion. Okay. Um, uh, Mark Paul is asked about mangroves and blue carbon um, and how that might work. We have to be a little bit careful about using terms here because I believe uh, blue carbon or some similar term has been uh, copyrighted by somebody. So, but, but um, be interested to hear what your thoughts are on, do you think that there's a market for, for a, a carbon credit like scheme or you think that we're just better off doing the work? Yeah, I, I, I think there definitely is. Uh, and this is why we need to bring in, I, one of the things I forgot to say, um, and I'll just diverge for a second, if I may, in my presentation was, we need to bring more expertise in now. Um, in a way, some, although the technology is all here and it's not just even, it's not evenly distributed, um, it, it's itsy bitsy bits of technology. Um, some of the offshore wind is getting more and more corporate and bigger and bigger. Uh, but the, some of the technology I've shown you are quite small, demonstrative, local area stuff. We've got to get this scaled up now. We've really got to stay, scale it. We've got to bring in clever people. We need architects, architects, landscape planners. We need infrastructure engineers. We need lawyers. We need all the financiers, the banks, the insurers, the account. They've all got to come into this to make this happen. Um, and that's where you'll start to get people thinking about carbon credits, blue economy credits, and all the rest of it. And the, the, the investment will start and will start to scale it. Um, on mangroves and the environment, um, satellites see everything. Um, so we might want to pull out people who are fishing and look at people who are fishing. But at the same time, that satellite's probably also seen an oil spill and it's seen a mangrove swamp and it's seen a receding coastline and all the rest of it. So I'm I'm packed that the sea vision I'm talking about is not sea vision just for fishing or just for the environment. It's sea vision for everything. And then we create services from that, information services from that, that everybody can use for whatever purpose. Um, and uh, we're increasingly getting there, increasingly make, making people realize that. The, the data sets are improving, the quality of the data sets improving, the business models are improving, the offering is becoming more like, a, more like mobile phone technology, packages of data, where you can buy stuff in clever ways, and that's what's got to happen. Uh, Alex Burrow, is there one project sector? Oh, <laughs> in the blue economy, what would that one project sector? Um, it's, you've got to start with, um, Energy, um, off, offshore energy, um, managed fisheries, so sustainable fisheries, looking on fish stocks as fish populations. This is wild fisheries uh, and aquaculture, uh, without a doubt, and aquaculture of all kinds, particularly shellfish uh, and seaweed and those sorts of more esoteric um, uh, um, systems, uh, I, I would say. Um, and then there's always the issue, I like the upcycling of waste, there's always the issues of um, gathering plastics and all the rest of it, that, that's a given. Um, so that's, the, that's where, what I would go, that's what I would say is where the uh, opportunity is, Alex. Noel Peters has talked a little bit about how private sector could get engaged. I should preface it, Noel, there is not a relation of mine, though he is a wonderful man. Um, Noel, uh, he works in the safeguard side in our private sector division. And obviously one of the concerns the private sector division has is how do we simplify and make de-risk these investments? Perhaps the way to answer that might be how using uh, a distributed approach, the, the example you used with scouring in the North Sea, how that might project proposals might be better presented so that you can reduce the risk of investment as opposed to simplify the risk of investment. Yeah, I agree with that entirely. I mean, I, I, 
if that is if there's any truth in that if you think about it really it's scandalous on the one hand but on the other hand it's entirely understandable human behavior it's what we do we simply <laughs> fail to uh, to share information across sectors and the other thing is if you go and talk to the finances and say I want to build a wind farm and the financier is, is tuned into offshore renewables. And you say, yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased. I'll be very pleased to put some money into that. And then you say, but I want to combine it with fish farm. You say, well, oh, I don't know anything about fish farms, not interest. They sound risky. There's all those sea lice problems. I saw sea spirits. So I don't want to get involved in that. Um, so we've, we've really got to show them that these things work and we've got to show them that they make money and we've got to show them that they sustain the um, they sustain the environment or they improve the environment. Um, and I'm, you know, the, there's, there's all sorts of ideas about um, shellfish farms, for example. At the moment, the boys that support the, the lines with the, the mussels hanging off them um, float on the surface. But actually, you could submerge a shellfish farm down to 50, 60 meters. Um, you could use it as a, as a mobile um, uh, uh, reef. Uh, um, uh, and, and then when you want to harvest it, you simply bring it to the surface, harvest it, put it back down again. Um, and shipping can trundle backwards and forwards over the top. Um, the Norwegians are looking at repositioning fish farms, having floating fish farms that can be repositioned. They, they look like um, uh, they've got little pods on the corners and they can drive them off somewhere. And they're talking about relocating them for the fishing season so the, the fishermen can come in and fish for the stock that they used to fish for. I'm not quite sure how that works, but that's the sort of thing they're looking at. <coughs> so there is, uh, it's nothing but potential. And what we've got to do is bring big money, big investment in. So your point's absolutely smack on, Steve. How do we, how do we reduce, show the, that we can mitigate the risk? And how can we show that there are margin there, margins there to make it worthwhile? What's going to result is change in corporate outlook, um, change in institutional structure. So that you don't just do offshore renewable, you become experts in offshore renewable plus agriculture plus floating harbors. Just going from there, Nick, the next question is probably to respond to uh, Mike Lockhart from in the Q&A talking about how much do you how much investment do you think is really needed? Do you have a rough idea on where that what that might be or if there's any published figures on that? Um, I, I, it's, <laughs> that's, that's, there, there are numbers out there. I'm, I'm now floundering a bit. Um, there are numbers out there. Um, I've seen numbers that say um, the global blue economy is worth um, a handful of billions to mega trillions. Um, and what that really says is nobody really has done it yet. Nobody has really sussed it out. And um, that is the, that is why I mentioned the, the business of understanding the, co the capital, the valuing of our capital. Um, so the answer to that is there are numerous studies. Uh, we, we, can, we can help you find some, uh, Michael, um, but they will be big numbers and you'll find different ranges across different studies. Um, I think one of the best I've seen is, as I said earlier, harnessing our ocean wealth. The Quebecois in uh, Canada have another strategy. Uh, the Irish were very clever. They uh, valued their sea space. They decided it was worthwhile. They mapped their sea space right during the economic downturn after 2008. So they came up with a real map of Ireland, um, which says that uh, Ireland is now uh, one tenth land and nine tenths sea. They put a number on it. They estimated what they would have to do to grow that blue economy and every year they run an annual review of the value they've added, the number of people that they've increased in terms of employment and how much they've grown the value of their overall economy. Um, I, so I would refer you to Harnessing Our Ocean Wealth uh, and the Real Map of Ireland as one of the best examples I've seen. And it is, it, to me, it is a case study of how so many ocean states could approach understanding what's in their sea space. Many of them simply don't know. It's back to sea blindness, and they don't know that they can have sea vision. That's a good point. That's a great point. 
I'm going to go to the Q and A and just follow up with a couple of questions, um, and I'm not going to do them in, a, in the the order. But I'll go with Francesco Ricciardi, who's a, one of our team members in Mares. He wanted to know your opinion on deep sea ocean mining. What do you think is going to be the impact of that, and do you think it has a place in the ocean economy? That's, that's a stonking question. Um, ocean mining. Uh, it's hugely, hugely controversial, and all sorts of big corporates have recently said they're not going to do it. I have to say, I think that the UN has gone about the environmental impact assessment of um, ocean mining in a very sophisticated way. And I think the efforts they've put into understanding the impact of seabed mining uh, have been uh, very, very good. If you put a great big 60 ton rock chewing monster on the seabed and drive it around, um, you will cause terrible damage to the environment. If you use very, and this is me going off on one again now, if you use very clever, sophisticated uh, AUVs that could go down and pick up individual uh, metallic nodules, um, you probably would do a lot less damage. Every time you take a trawler to sea, and drag the nets across the seabed, you rape and pillage and you leave the effects of open cast mining on the seabed. So we've been doing what we're worrying about in terms of um, seabed minerals uh, with fishing for hundreds of years. We've done untold damage. So there's a balance to be had. I, I personally think that the we should continue to assess whether or not we can extract minerals from the seabed, but we should continue to do so in the very cautious way that the UN has advocated so far, and we shouldn't go into it helter-skelter. It needs to be compared with the damage that we're gonna do, extracting lithium and all the other rare metals that we need from places like the, uh, the Congo. How much more damage do we want to do in, in those areas uh, to extract stuff um, uh, 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 and leave the seabed pristine. Um, so there's, there's a, it's a, going to be a long, ongoing conversation. The danger is you become a bit of a religious zealot and you say, absolutely, no way, no seabed mining. Um, I don't think that's the way we should go. I think we should understand it. And it comes back to mapping the seabed and understanding what's down there. Um, and we not even really begun to do that. If you want to see how much we need to do to map the seabed, have a look at uh, Seabed 2030, which is a project being run by the UN under the auspices of the International Hydrographic Organization. Andy, would you mind? Uh, Andy is already, I can see, about to put the link to it. It's a, We've been doing the feasibility studies for Seabed 2030. Nick, can I just ask you a question? How much of the seabed is actually mapped? Uh, well, we say, uh, you'll see on CBED 2030, we reckon it's about 20% of the seabed, the world seas and oceans have been mapped to a resolution of 100 uh, metres or better. And the aim of CBED 2030 is to map the remaining 80% by 2030, which is known in the business as a stretch target, I think. Um, people tend to, the, the, the apocryphal tale is, we definitely now know more about the surface of Mars than we know about our seabeds. So again, this is a massive opportunity. And it's not just a business of understanding the resources that are down there. It's understanding how currents work, deep, how deep sea currents work, how they move energy around the seas and oceans and how that affects the climate. Um, so there's Seabed 2030 I'm a big fan of. We won't do 100% by 2030. But again, if we could bring the sort of energy that President Biden is bringing to the debate to mapping the seas and oceans, we could do that tomorrow. And uh, we, could, tomorrow, we could start tomorrow. And um, again, have a look at uh, enhancing our ocean wealth. Could you bung that up, please, Andy? H-O-O-W should bring it up. Um, enhancing our ocean wealth. Um, they mapped all of their seabed. And now any Irish politician will tell you Ireland is one tenth land and nine tenths sea and the value of our sea space is this. We have a number of, uh, of developing member countries which have massive uh, 
ocean areas, um, places like the Cook Islands and the Republic of Marshall Islands, um, to name a few. Um, so this is part of the, the interest we have in this space. Um, can I lead on to two more questions? Uh, my colleague Tora Ito, who's a gas and hydrogen expert, um, has been doing a lot of work on hydrogen, and he was interested in your views about what you think would be the best uh, ocean energy source and where. And it's okay if you don't have an answer for that, Nick, because that's somebody else's job and he's actually being hired. And that person's already been hired and we've got a hydrogen guy coming on hopefully sometime in the next two or three days. So do you have any initial thoughts? Um, it's, it's a combination of them. Um, it's a combination of solutions. Um, and I, in terms of where, I personally think it's in, I'm going to go back to complex sea basins again. I think it's complex sea spaces where these should be done. So I wouldn't say it must be done in this particular country, although clearly that's going to happen. It's all to do with understanding the energy that is in the sea space. It's all to do with understanding what the sea space looks like, who the uh, coastal nations are who share that sea space, and how they are prepared to work together on it. And then it's a question of how much energy you can generate and how you can distribute it. Um, if you would just, there are very few states can go it alone. So we've got, to, in my opinion, we've got to do it in complex sea basins and we've got to share the information so that we can then share the resultant energy. And of course, nothing of what I've waved my arm around and got excited about this morning will work without energy. And clearly in future, it's gonna to have to be renewable energy. So I would say all bets are off as to what sorts of energy. Um, it's, it's a combination of, and it's a question of understanding how you're going to share the energy and distribute it. Um, uh, so that's not the answer to the question. I'm very glad you're bringing in an expert, but I do think um, it's about complex sea bases. I've talked about the China seas and Asia, but there are numerous other complex sea basins. Here in the UK, it's the, the North Sea, the Celtic Sea and the English Channel. Uh, there's the Mediterranean, the Adriatic, the Black Sea, um, the, uh, the Arabian Gulf, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, and then all those sea spaces um, uh, uh, around the islands that you've mentioned in the South Pacific and so on. Um, uh, and, and of course, this has got to be addressed in the context of rising sea levels. So how are you going to do it? So that takes you down the route of floating. And just coming back to the value, if you, if you start to get nations like Palau and RMI, low-lying nations, they, they have a value in their sea space. How do, how, do they, how do they record that value and how do they retain it as they, uh, as they have problems of rising sea levels? So again, uh, the demonstration programs that come out of uh, Mares, uh, I, I believe need to address that, show how the business model works. Who owns that value? Let's say you have to ab abandon a piece of territory because of sea level. Um, the value is still there. Who owns it? So, we're coming up to the end of the hour. I'd like to thank you, Nick. I'd also like to recognize uh, our colleagues and friends from uh, some of the country, the developing member countries. I see a few names there that I know from RMI, um, you know, Yakwe to our friends in RMI. And uh, I'd also like to thank Andy for backing up. Uh, there's one last question which Peter DuPont has asked about ocean acidification. And uh, that's not going to be answered in 30 seconds, but I think that is a good way to talk about the number, the next set of discussions we're going to have. We're going to try and do a talk on Mares once a week uh, from the various experts. The next expert is Tom Bowling, who's on the call, who will be, who is based in Palau and is just uh, picking up after the cyclone that went through there last weekend. Um, and Tom will talk about regenerative fishing. Uh, regenerative aquaculture and his the business is going on there and we will have a number of the other experts present and I think after the ASEF presentation we're going to invite someone to go into a lot more detail about ocean acidification um, so uh, I'm going to post a link to a website that will be live 
um, sometime in the next day or so, which is where you'll be able to find a copy of the recording of this presentation and also the presentation materials um, on the site. So Nick, thank you very much. Andy, thank you very much. Everybody, thank you for attending. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event, which is Monday, the 3rd of May at 2 p.m. for Tom Bowling to talk about regenerative marine aquaculture. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Steve. Okay, Minette, we can stop recording.